So what we're going to look at is cybercrime, and it's a growing threat. And I'd like to start out by showing you what the upward trend looks like. What we have here is a chart that shows that the number of cybersecurity incidents rose from about 5,500 in 2006 up to over 67,000 in 2014. These are just incidents that hit federal government agencies in the US. Globally and across all sectors, the number of incidents is estimated to have risen from about 9 million in 2010 to over 43 million in 2014. Now, many cyber crimes are represented by these incidents. And in particular, any crime that steals data, sabotages data, or makes data unavailable. All of those crimes are, represent security incidents. And then there's a pile of additional crimes that don't fall in that area. And that includes things like child exploitation in cyberspace, and also internet scams. The global cost of all these crimes is estimated to be on the order of 400 to 600 billion dollars annually. And that's roughly in the same ballpark as narcotics crimes. So in the uh, remainder of the talk, what I'm going to do is give you seven reasons why cybercrime has been on the rise. And the first reason is that it pays, it's very easy, and the chances of you getting caught are pretty low. So why does it pay? Well, today, all of our money is online. And in many cases, the criminals will get direct access to our bank accounts, and they will transfer money straight out of our accounts into theirs. In other cases, they will hack into companies like Target and Home Depot, and they will download tens of millions of credit and debit cards. And they will take this information and they will, in some cases, convert it uh, to make counterfeit cards, and then they'll withdraw money from ATM machines from your account. Or they might just sell the card information in the computer underground, or they might just go on a shopping spree at your expense. Now, not all of the crimes are financial. We've also got uh, lots of spies. Uh, they're stealing corporate data and government data. And in some cases, there are students who thought maybe they could get better grades by hacking into their school systems. I don't recommend doing that. A couple students in Southern California were recently arrested for trying. And activists have also found that cyber attacks make for an interesting way of protesting. And what you see on the right here is you see one of the first web defacements to have taken place almost 20 years ago now. And somebody hacked the home page of the Department of Justice, and they changed it to read Department of Injustice. And they were protesting something called the Communication Decency Act. Well, in that case, that particular act was eventually ruled unconstitutional. OK, the second reason why cybercrime is on the rise is that there's just way too many doors, and the number of doors is going up every year. So if we go back in time to the 1940s, when the first computers were appearing, there was just a handful of computers. They were big, they were clunky, expensive, and they were not connected. And there was no cybercrime. In fact, cybercrime didn't start happening until the 60s. Okay, and then it was just, you know, computer crime, one of the most, it was mostly embezzlement. Okay, or people taking sledgehammers to computers because they hated them. So right now, we've got about 3 billion people online, and they are using anywhere from 5 to 15 billion devices. And all of these devices are connected, and all those connections represent doors. And on top of the obvious doors with the connections, most of these devices have vulnerabilities in them. And so that creates back doors, and somebody's going to find them. Going forward in time, the estimates are that there's going to be 25 to 50 billion devices online in what some people refer to as the Internet of Things, because everything is going to be connected. And those things are, a lot of them, going to have back doors in them. The third reason why cybercrime is on the rise is that security 
is just not very convenient. And uh, so if you're like me, you know, you're working away on your computer, you're trying to get something done, and all of a sudden this window pops up telling you you have to do a critical update, or otherwise hackers are going to take over your computer. So do you stop and do the update? Well, sometimes, but maybe not. Right? You put it off. Another example is uh, password. So we all know we're supposed to pick good passwords. And uh, I hope none of you are seeing any of your passwords on this list. Because these have all been hacked. These get, whenever a hacker gets into a server and they download the password file, they start cracking them, and these always show up. Uh, the recent attack on the Ashley Madison cheating site, these same passwords showed up. And there were some other gems, too. Like, one of my favorites was, um, quote, I should not be doing this. <laughs> and uh, another good one was, quote, the best password ever. <laughs> and then a third uh, example here of the inconvenience. This has to do with encryption. So encryption is a really powerful tool. If you encrypt up your data and somebody gets access to it, they can't make any sense out of it. It just looks like gibberish. The problem is it's not very convenient, especially not convenient for communications. Because you, if you are messaging with somebody else, you have to be using the same kind of encryption. Well, what we have here is a tweet from somebody by the name of Joseph Bonneau. And he had sent an encrypted email to a guy by the name of Phil Zimmerman. And it was encrypted with something called Pretty Good Privacy, or PGP. And Zimmerman had written back saying, I can't decrypt this. I don't have PGP running on any of my devices. Do you have PGP running on your devices? No, right? I don't either. But what's interesting here is that Phil Zimmerman is the person who developed PGP. <laughs> to make matters worse, the bad guys are pretty good with encryption. This is an example of something called ransomware. And it's called CryptoLocker, this particular example. And the way you get this on your computer is you open up one of those attachments you're not supposed to open up. And you do not want this on your computer because it encrypts up all your data and it won't give you the key to decrypt it unless you pay up. And there's a little clock ticking. At the time this screenshot was made, there was about 54 hours left. And that's all the time you have to pay up before your data is gone forever. I think about a half a million people got hit with that one. Next reason uh, for the rise in cybercrime is that there's lots of flaws in software. Uh, this shows there's thousands of new vulnerabilities found in software every year. These are vulnerabilities in your operating system, your browser, your applications. Uh, they're all over the place. Even the security products, your antivirus, these things have flaws too. And now this is just software flaws, and there's all the vulnerabilities that come from bad passwords and not doing security updates and opening attachments and all that. The actual largest vulnerability is the human being. Well, this is what happens when a new vulnerability is found in software. Okay, if somebody develops an exploit for it, and then the criminals all start using it, and the attacks skyrocket they can go up by five orders of magnitude. That's 100,000 times. The heart, the bleeding heart there, uh, represents more than just the sad state of affairs. Okay, that's the actual logo of a vulnerability called heart bleed. And if somebody exploits that vulnerability, they can get your password when you log into a supposedly secure HTTPS site. Now, this vulnerability was found over 18 months ago. As of a couple of weeks ago, there were still at least 200,000 sites out on the internet that had not done their security updates. You do not want to go to one of those sites. Now, as, as we talked about before, security updates, they're not convenient. Well, it's even worse for companies than it is for us as individuals. Companies have to manage networks of hundreds or thousands of devices. A study by Kena Securities found that it takes companies 100 to 120 days to do security updates on average. But that after 60 days, the chances of the vulnerability being exploited are over 90%. Next reason is that 
Building secure software, you know, let's get rid of all these vulnerabilities. Well, it's really hard. So how many of you in the audience have ever written more than, say, 10 lines of code? Right? A whole bunch of you. Okay, what about 1,000 lines of code? Not so many hands. Well, now imagine your devices, they're running tens or hundreds of millions of lines of code. The last version, the latest version of Windows is said to have more than 100 million lines of code just by itself. And it's very complex. And believe me, getting it all right is a humongous task. And so it ships with vulnerabilities. And the problem is aggravated because the companies are under market pressure to get to market first. One study found that 79% of companies, they actually ship products with known security vulnerabilities in them. To make matters worse, there's theoretical limitations on what we can do. Fred Cohen showed back in the 1980s that you could not write an antiviral tool that would detect all possible viruses. And then the technology is constantly evolving. There's new stuff coming out. New versions of everything is coming out. And it really is a task like Sisyphus, pushing the boulder up the hill. It goes on and on. Another reason is and now sometimes people intentionally put back doors into products. And this can happen anywhere in the supply chain. A few years ago, a couple of students at NPS, they found 170 products that had malicious code placed in them during, in some place in the supply chain. Recently, someone found over 4,000 apps on Apple's iOS app store that had malicious code in them. Now, it's not that the app developers did that on purpose to get you although there are some that do that too. In this case, somebody had taken Apple's development kit, software development kit called Xcode. They had taken that and they put malicious code in it and they posted it up on a server in China. And then Chinese app developers would download that version of Xcode, probably because the download times would be faster uh, from the Chinese server. And then all the apps that were developed with that tainted version of Xcode, the malicious code went straight into the apps. So not just a single out Apple here, is that uh, Android phones. Android phones, somebody found that rogue retailers were taking Android phones that were manufactured in China and they were intentionally putting malicious code in them before they sold them to customers. Okay, and then uh, finally, the seventh reason for the growth in cybercrime here is that there's just shady sites in neighborhoods. And if you visit these sites, you can pick up malicious code or you might just get, find yourself in some internet scam or start getting lots of spam or any number of other things that you'd probably rather not have to deal with. So these are top level domains that I recommend you just stay clear of. Uh, Dot .church, dot .gov, and dot .mil all have less, less than 1% shady sites. But it's not just shady sites. The hackers, they attack legitimate sites, and they put malicious code on those sites so that when you visit those sites, you get the malicious code. Sometimes that's called a drive-by download because you don't even have to click on anything. You just go to the site. It turns out that about 4% of the top 1 million websites were found with malicious code that had been hacked onto them. 1% of ads also have malicious software in them. So what do we do about all this? Uh, well, there's not time to give you any solutions, but let me just say that there's no silver bullet. Okay, We can't just redesign the internet and redesign all our technology and all these gazillions of bytes of code, okay? And so I like to think of cybercrime as really just part of the pr problem of crime in general. We can't ever expect to really solve it, and yet we can't give up. It would be dumb to not lock your house or lock your car, okay? So we have to constantly be diligent, always trying to do better and uh, control the risk. And let me just leave you with one thing. We need help okay, in this area. And so there's lots of exciting job opportunities if you're thinking about what you might want to do when you finish all your schooling. 
Uh, we need uh, people that are cybersecurity experts. We need software developers that understand the security issues so they can avoid them. Uh, we need cybercrime investigators, computer forensics examiners, and we need people that can educate our legislators so that when they start passing bills, they'll be, they'll, the bills will make sense. And uh, let me just end with uh, one thought. I've been in this field now for more than 40 years, since the very early days. And I can promise you one thing, it is never boring. <laughs>